Okay, in this video, I'm going to explain interlanguage and fossilization in second language acquisition. <clears throat> These concepts are very, very important, so please try to understand them. So, what is interlanguage? Um, here, inter means between, and so um, interlanguage is something that is between the first language and the target language. So in the case of um, yeah, someone like me who is Japanese and learning English as a second language, um, in my case, and the um, first language, the mother tongue is Japanese. And the target language is English, okay? And <clears throat> my interlanguage is here between my um, mother tongue, which is Japanese, and the target language, which is English, okay? So my interlanguage is, of course, different from my first language, but it's also different from um, my target language, because my English is um, different from native English speakers' English. So um, interlanguage is something that is um, between our first language and the target language. So it's not quite the same as the first language and the target language. But of course, um, as our second language learning uh, proceeds, our interlanguage approaches the target language. Of course, I hope so. So um, this gets better and better, and this approaches the target language. So, um, <clears throat> and we need to understand the properties of this thing in the language. We need to know, we need to know the characteristics of interlanguage because this is our second language, actually. <clears throat> but can we predict all proper properties of interlanguage from the uh, first language and the target language alone? So uh, from this and from this, can we pr predict the properties of this thing from this and from this alone? <clears throat> Um, in 1950s, we had this thing called contrastive analysis. And this said, yes, we can predict all properties of interlanguage from the first language and the target language. So what contrastive analysis said is something like this. So we compare um, the first language and the target language. So for example, Japanese and English and we try to find structural differences or grammatical differences. There are many, many grammatical differences um, between Japanese and English. And contrastive analysis hypothesized that um, second language learners will, f will find those and only those um, differences difficult. So this is a very, very famous statement. Um, <clears throat> Uh, from contrastive analysis, uh, those elements which are similar to the learner's native language will be simple for him. Similar, simple. And those elements that are different will be difficult. <coughs> so, um, for example, um, there are many uh, grammatical differences between Japanese and English, and people like me, um, um, Japanese people learning English, they will find those grammatical differences difficult to learn, okay? <clears throat> so this is um, a very famous hypothesis by contrastive analysis. But sadly, um, contrast the prediction or hypothesis by contrastive analysis turned out to be wrong. So some properties, or well, actually many, um, properties of interlanguage are present in neither the L1 nor the target language. So for example, um, many um, second language learners 
Many learners of English as a second language um, say something like this. What does part doing now? So this is um, grammatically incorrect. This is not grammatical, okay? So uh, in English, I mean. <coughs> and native English speakers don't say this because this is not um, grammatical. But this is not present in the learners L1 either. So where does this come from? <coughs> So, for example, um, there is no equivalent of this in Japanese and maybe in any other language. <coughs> so, this doesn't come from the L1, this doesn't come from the target language, which is English either. So, actually, um, this is created by second language learners. So, they create this kind of um, sentence. And in this sense, second language acquisition is a creative process. So this is a very, very important point. And um, <clears throat> here we need to understand this concept of developmental errors. So for example, um, um, learners of second, uh, um, English as a second language or English as a foreign language, they sometimes say things like he doesn't knows my name okay this is not grammatical and we didn't went there this is um ungrammatical also and he put it the cookie fair this is also ungrammatical many many um esl learners say this and these are pro produced um by those learners because their second language ability is actually developing so because they are making progress, they produce errors like these. And these errors are very different from transfer errors. So here transfer means transfer from um, the mother tongue to the um, L2. So for example, um, in Japanese, the basic word order is SOV. Um, as opposed to SVO in English, okay? So a Japanese um, learner of English may say something like John a book bought, okay? Um, this word order is correct in Japanese, but it's not correct in English. And if um, someone like me, a Japanese uh, who is learning English um, says this, okay, so this is um, uh, this can be considered as a transfer error but actually this kind of error is very very rare we don't um, very often hear this kind of error but we <coughs> but we often hear um, these errors so actually um, second language learners produce far more development errors than transfer errors so um, based, um, um, so if you look at um, a book um, by these people, um, <coughs> it seems that um, errors produced by child second language errors um, <coughs> contain only um, only a very very few uh, number of um, transfer errors, just about five percent. <coughs> and um, um, child second language um, learners produce many many developmental errors. Developmental errors account for about 85 percent. But in the case of adults, um, they seem to produce more transfer errors. But yet, um, um, the number of developmental errors is a lot more than the number of transfer errors, even in adults, okay? <coughs> so, um, EFL teachers and ESL, te uh, ESL teachers, and um, someone like me who is interested in second language acquisition as research, um, they need to know and we need to know 
um, so for example, um, English, and actually we, um, so if, um, if you are an EFL teacher, you, I think you already know English or the grammar of English, like um, the syntax of English, the phonology of English, and perhaps you already know the learners L1. So if you are a Japanese teacher of EFL, you know the learners L1. So you, because you also speak Japanese. And, <coughs> and these teachers and researchers also need to know the nature of interlanguage. Um, knowing this and this is not enough. We have to know the nature of interlanguage and the nature of second language acquisition. So, um, so this is our second language. So it is in our mind or it is in our brain. And uh, we, even if we know um, the learners uh, L1 and the learners target language uh, or the grammars of these languages, we can't really predict the properties of the thing. We just can't. So we have to know this, of course, but it's, that's not enough. We have to know about this. We have to study this too. So uh, coming back to uh, one of the area points. So second language acquisition is a creative process. So according to this um, researcher, a learner at a particular point in time is in fact using a language a language system which is neither the L1 nor the L2, okay? And to understand the process of second language acquisition properly, we have to study interlanguage in its own right, okay? Um, not in reference to the L1 and the target language. And sometimes um, <coughs> um, researchers say the study of second language acquisition is almost equal to the study of interlanguage. Okay, so um, this is our first question. Can we predict all property properties of interlanguage from the L1 and the target language alone? Um, the answer is no. Interlanguage has properties that are attributable neither to the L1 nor to the target language. Okay, so, um, <coughs> and this is our second question. Does our interlanguage reach the target language if we keep living in a country where it is spoken? <coughs> so, um, our interlanguage gradually approaches the target language. But does it become the same as the target language? So this is our second question. So let's look at some cases. So the first case is this person called Wes. And he is um, uh, oh excuse me. Um, so he is a um, Japanese artist um, who immigra immigrated to Hawaii after becoming an adult. Okay, so he uh, moved to Hawaii when he was thirty-three. And. Um, while he was in Japan, he studied English, but that was only at junior high school. Um, so his study of English was um, very limited. <coughs> uh, but uh, he had a very, very nice personality. He was very social and he was outgoing, talk talkative and extrovert. And uh, while he was in Hawaii, um, his um, uh, 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 he mostly used English, so um, <coughs> uh, maybe he also used um, Japanese to some extent, but most of his language use was in English, okay? <coughs> and this is um, 
um, some data um, um, about his um, uh, use of um, grammatical morphemes. Um, <clears throat> And uh, his data um, was obtained twice. Okay. <clears throat> and um, the second set of data um, um, were obtained two years later um, um, than uh, the first time. Okay. <clears throat> and so, for example, please take a look at this third. Um, singular. This uh, is um, this thing. Um, so s at the end of a verb. So we need to have this s when um, the subject is a um, uh, third person singular. <coughs> okay. And you know, um, in nineteen um, seventy-eight, um, the accuracy. Um, um, of this person with his accuracy was zero percent, so he couldn't do it at all. So he couldn't put s um, when it was necessary at all. But two years later, um, his accuracy was just about twenty percent. So he didn't he did didn't make much progress. And please take a look at this. 0% and two years later, 0% again. So um, he couldn't do this at all. So um, <coughs> um, putting ed at the end of a verb um, when it is in the past tense. So um, even though he was in Hawaii and he was speaking English uh, most of the time, um, his uh, grammatical accuracy um, didn't improve a lot. So very little progress was observed in the uh, three-year period of data collection. Okay. And um, <coughs> Um, well, actually, this is um, his English, <laughs> and um, here he talks about his own English. So, um, so he says, "I know I'm speaking funny English because I'm never learning. I'm only just listen. <laughs> um, I'm only just listen, then talk." But people understand well. Some people confuse before okay, but now is a little bit difficult because many people I'm meeting only just one time. Um, well, I I can understand everything he says, but um, um, his English is um not quite grammatical. Um, <coughs> well. So he can make himself understood, um, but um, his grammatical accuracy um, is not quite high. So I'm, bef I'm always, I hate school. <laughs> well, I can understand him, but we don't say this. And the next case is this person called Ayako. So she's also from Japan. So Ayako is a Japanese lady who immigrated to Hawaii in 1948, just after World War II. And she uh, moved to, uh, sorry, she moved to Hawaii um, when she was 22 years old. And people like her were called war brides, war brides. And she got married to an American man. But I think this American man, um, or maybe his parents, or his grandparents, were also from Japan. 
So this American man, um, um, how can I put it? Um, he, yes, <laughs> yes. He or no, no, maybe not he himself, but his um, family um, was also from Japan. And she lived in Hawaii for more than 50 years. And she was popular among local people. She was using English most of the time, and she was fluent in conversational English. Okay, she lived in Hawaii for more than 50 years. Okay, so this is um, data on her accuracy of using plural S. So S here. And this data was taken in 1985. Just about 70%, so not perfect. But this was more than 30 years later than her arrival in Hawaii. So even though she spent more than 30 years in Hawaii, her accuracy of using plural S um, wasn't perfect. 10 years later, her accuracy actually got worse. So it became worse, actually. And past tense marking, so kicked and wait, things like this. Her accuracy of um, using um, past tense marking was below 50% in both 1985 and, 19, and 1995. So sometimes she could supply ED, but other times she couldn't. And overall, Ayako's grammatical competence did not improve very much, even though she lived in Hawaii for many, many years. But they had very nice personalities. They had the both of them. <clears throat> both had personalities that are suitable for second language learning. So they are social, extrovert, talkative, etc. Both could use conversational English to social socialize with local people. But their ability to use grammatical morphemes, um, such as um, plural S or third person singular S, or um, ED stopped developing without reaching a native-like level. So inter language gradually approaches the target language, although it seldom merges with the target language totally. Sometimes it reaches a stable plateau. So the interlanguage doesn't really become the same as the target language. So as time goes by, um, interlanguage um, gets better and better. So it grows, it develops, <coughs> but at some point it stops developing. So um, that state um, is called a plateau. Uh, that's a state of no change. And when this happens, we say um, the uh, uh, fossilization has occurred. So the word fos fossilization comes from the word fossil. So uh, this is an example of a fossil. And so uh, fossilization means to become permanently established in the interlanguage of a second language learner in a form that is deviant. Deviant means different from the target language norm. So, um, <coughs> so like this thing, um, something that has um, fossilized, um, um, it, it became fixed in an ancient form and will never change. Well, um, 
Oh, sorry. I, I, okay, I wrote this just to explain this thing. Sorry. So, <clears throat> so this thing, a fossil became fixed in an ancient form and will never change. So, um, <clears throat> and fossilization in second language acquisition is something like this. Okay. It stops um, improving. It stops developing. So it will not change. Uh, at least change, it will not change for the better. So um, <coughs> let's summarize. So interlanguage has properties that are attribut attributable neither to the L1 nor to the um, target language. L2 learners create interlanguage, create interlanguage, and L2 acquisition is a creative process. So, um, so uh, we should study interlanguage in its own right. The study of L2 acquisition is almost equal to the study of interlanguage. Interlanguage gradually approaches the target language, but often stops improving. It can become fossilized without reaching a native-like level. And this tends to happen in aspects of grammar, such as plural S or past tense marking. OK, these are the references. Thanks for listening.